Welcome, audience, to another episode of the True Crime Archives. I'm your host, CJ Data. And this is Pitt, Ma- Pitt McCarthy. Alright, so, now, first of you clicking on this video may wonder, does this count? Count. Because, well, I'd say crimes against humanity do count. But even if they don't, in a traditional true crime sense, it's my show. I'll do whatever I want with it. But either way. But either way, so King Leopold II, a tyrant all often forgotten. Got, well, not forgotten. A lot of stuff of his was actually covered up until more recent times. When it was becoming harder and harder to ignore the reality of it. Yeah, there's been a lot of times when uh, events are going on at that time period to get brushed into the rug, only to be found out like decades later. Oh, without a doubt. So. Alright, so. So let's just. Let's just start off kind of with. So basically, what we're going to be covering today is the horrific. Crimes Against Humanity that King Leopold II caused in what was known at the, at the, at the time as the Congo Free State. Yeah, uh, free, be, free being in quotations. Yeah. Alright, so King Leopold II was, was born on April 9th, 1835, five to his father... Father Leopold the first, and and his mother Queen Louise. Louise. He was. Let's just. I'm just gonna get out of the way. He he did not get a lot of love from his parents, especially his mother. Mother who would constantly make mock his appearance, especially with the nose he inherited from his father. So I was technically saying she was also making fun of the dad. Yeah, and, and basically just saying, you know, and pretty much saying that, and saying, you should tell him he had the beak of a bird. But as he grew up, he got, he was, he got put in a, into an arranged marriage to Marie Hen. Riet, I think that's how you say it, I forgive me, of Austria. Which you, since he had no idea what a loving marriage looked like, you could probably guess it was kind of awkward. Um, yeah, a lot of royal marriages at that time, at that, even at that time, were uh, typically not matters of love. <laughs> yeah, and also, coincidentally, his aunt was Queen Victoria of England, which is surprising. Crazy, a crazy thing is a lot of a good amount of European royals were related to Queen Victoria. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And basically, you know, like she actually gave him some good sex advice because because she had a good relationship at least at that point in time with her with her then husband, and I believe was was King Albert. Albert. So. <laughs> and but eventually figured it out because they had two daughters together. You'd think that back then though having good sex having good sex wasn't a thing though, you'd think, right? Right, but let's not focus on that too much. So after his father died, he inherited the throne and let's and pretty much and it's and it just seemed, well, basically, monarchy, the way it was ran, was changing. It wasn't just under one man, you know? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, but at that point, any monarchies that was still around pretty much ended up becoming a constitutional monarchy. Yeah. Well, well, with the exception of a few nations, Russia definitely, Russia was, I think, had this uh, system, too, I think. I think anyway, I can't remember for sure. And pretty much one of the royals, I don't remember, at one of the little conferences that he had, they overheard him say that really all we have, all us kings have to look forward to nowadays is money. 
We'll have to look for him. definitely did take that to heart because he was very materialistic. Well, when you when you can't get love from your parents, where else are you gonna get it from? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Just get love. Just make love yourself with money and whatnot. All right. So now let's get to how this whole whole thing basically came about. So basically. His father tried many times to conquer a nation for Belgium because he felt, you know, if, if, they, if they didn't conquer a nation, they would have no significance among their European peers. Oh, yeah. Back then, that was back then the whole conquest thing was about prestige and resources. It's like, hey, it makes us look good and we get out of it. So, basically... Basically, he set his eye on the Congo, which was largely unexplored by, uh, which was largely mainly unexplored, you know, at at that point in time, except with a couple exceptions, and it had been mainly unclaimed, claimed except for the coastal areas. Now, well, there was kind of a reason for that, you know. Oh yeah, the terrain and a good portion of Africa was well pretty hostile. Not just that. Well, this particular area, it was pretty much, it was more jungle. And pretty much that part of it was was seemingly difficult to colonize because the, because the rainforests, forests and other areas, they're filled, filled with, with, with leopards, lions, gorillas. Poisonous insects. Poisonous in Diseases. Poisonous in insects. X hippopotamuses, which yeah, they can be dangerous because they are very territorial. Oh yeah, hippos will hippos will not hesitate to even bite a crocodile in half. Yeah, and speaking of which, there were also, I believe, Nile crocodiles that also lived in the area. So yeah, it's definitely a wild place that I would say the majority of you know, like, well-off people didn't exactly want to go down there and inhabit. Yeah, and, and the parts of Africa that weren't rainforest were just barren desert, essentially. Pretty much. So, pretty much, at the conference, he noticed it, and he basically said, Hey, you're not used there. Uh, can I have it? And they're like, sure. But, but he knew it wouldn't go over well if... Well, if he said, oh, his greedy intentions, that he was going to, that, you know, that, you know, like, he just wanted it as his own personal property, you know? Well, it, honestly, Bo, it's not like, honestly, Bo, looking at it, it's not like he ran it any different than what the rest of the European powers did their colonies. Well, <laughs> not like he really ran it much differently. Well, if anything, this is, but he did do some things that, that others didn't. That the others didn't, because again, there was, you know, we'll get to, to all the stuff that he did that, that you know, like, while, while, you know, yeah, while, you know, like, the others didn't do it in things any better, they at least somewhat followed it, with some exceptions, but either way, we'll get to that. Okay. Well, he, and, but he basically made up this lie and said, oh, I want to colonized and, and and bring Christianity and humanitarianism to the poor Congolese people. People, and that was enough to get him rolling, so so yeah, they he, he ended up getting ownership of the Congo and he sent sent and so he sent this journalist by journalist and also African, you know, like explorer by the name of of Henry Morton Stanley, who actually became quite the expert on the continent, and he also saw great potential for it to be colonized, and he actually went to the Queen of England, saying we should do it, but they're just like, no, we don't want to do that. But King Leopold found his work, 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 and said, go colonize it for me, then. And that's just what he did. He basically used a bunch of parlor tricks to scare the natives, Natives, such as giving, you know, giving the native man, a native man, a gun, gun with, you know, nothing but, but probably powder in it, and ha and saying, shoot me, you know? 
Yeah. Only to have the bullet in his shoe the whole time, basically just saying, oh, white men are spirits that can't be killed. Killed and just using a bunch of, you know, like, whatever. And so he basically scared, you know, like, the Congolese chiefs into signing signing the treaties, m making, giving, you know, like ownership of King Leopold, uh, giving it from them to King Leopold. But as you can probably and, guess, these, and these, these the chiefs... disaster began. And it's likely the chiefs had no idea what this piece of paper even said. Oh, yeah, most likely, because I, I highly doubt any of them could read Belgian. Yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Oh, this is now. This is where it gets fun, and I use that with sarcasm to the highest degree. Oh yeah, it, it was real fun. All right, for him anyway. All right, so so while even though it can be debated, while King Leopold never stepped foot in the Congo, it's well that's debated. But anyway. By a small, smaller group of people, but either way, that's not the point. It w he come to find out that it had a plentiful supply of rubber trees, which was actually very in demand and very, you know, profitable at that point in time due to the bicycle industry right? and even the early automotive industry. Oh yeah, rubber was definitely in high demand as a product, kind of like how oil is now. And pretty much, and he found when he got word of this, he debated on like how was he going to pay for all the manu manual labor labor necessary, necessary to you know, you know, do all the work. But that's the catch; he didn't pay for it. That, but as I was not, he decided, oh, I'll just do the cheap way and, and enslave the 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 pop entire population of the Congolese people to do my bidding, and if not, not mutilate them or kill them. Yeah, and he had this whole thing known as the uh, this mercenary force, known as the force publique, and they would be going around and showing down rubber quotas, which by the way were absolutely absurd, were met, or else you would be punished, you would just be killed. <laughs> absolutely, and the, I hear, I hear one way that he actually had them do it was basically hack at the vines and have the rubber pretty much squirt onto their skin, and then once they got enough of them, once they were covered, scrape it off into like a little basket. Yikes. Yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, when it, when is when the force public would kill somebody for not meeting a rubber quota, they would also have to cut off one of their hands and show it as like, hey, uh this is hey, I killed somebody. And apparently the reason for that was just because, oh, they were afraid, you know, like, bullets were being wasted. Well, that, that's honestly the least of your problems now, isn't it? I know, that's the least of a problem. Once. And, and not even, and not just the execution spell. A ton of millions of people ended up dying from diseases alone, like smallpox, which was pretty rampant for most of human history. And starvation, and among an exhaustion well let's go in to what the force public was there was basically a mercenary force as you just said said who it was basically comprised of like the strongest you know like of tribal men that they pretty much you know made them do their will you know oh yeah because all colonies across the that you you Pretty much all Europeans had had some form of native mercenary force. Yeah. And, yeah, it was definitely... This was a crap show for sure. But as time went on, though... Now, in total, it's not really known how much, you know... How many, what exactly the population was at that point in time, but but many estimate that more that pretty much 
almost pro that or more than half of the population was wiped out by the time you know like he was pulled from ownership and that is definitely not surprising at the very least absolutely not and speaking uh, and as years kind of went by by as i said it's let's just say it eventually the stuff eventually came to light and it did not go unnoticed it's like for example even though he said oh they could freely explore and trade with the country he became very nervous because for obvious reasons because oh, at, yeah because at this point slavery was was outlawed in the european regions uh, at that point, it was also uh, a lot of the U.S. too. At that point, yeah, and uh, definitely the U.S. for sure. It's the only ones that still kind of had slavery were the South American areas, where some didn't outlaw it as late as 1920. So, he so, yeah, definitely another thing. So basically, one thing that ended up coming to light was when a African American and preacher, and and some say he was also he also participated in the Civil War in the Civil War in some way, named George Washington Williams. He came to there and he was horrified by what he saw and wrote an open letter to the king, which of course he just discarded and ignored. Of course. And ignored and one person actually actually came there to, to trade with some rubber but he ended up getting hung for some reason I don't I can't remember why but that also didn't go unnoticed because he actually had to pay s significant fines to two countries for violating the treaties and then that's when everything started to unravel and yeah, and of course some, and also he al also there was definitely this point called the scramble for Africa, which there were these you know, like Arab people that were basically explorers there trying to look for resources for themselves, but King Leopold basically said told him another he's like oh they're African slave traders traders we got to get rid of them just so we can keep it to himself remain control over the Congo, which, which sparked, you know, the two-year war between them and, you know, and, you know, the Arabs. That was more of a pointless war than, than a lot of other pointless wars, you know? Yeah, some wars were definitely pointless and throughout history. Yep. And, heck, once this really started to get out in the get out like there a heavy protest movement of at the turn of the century or of in the early 1900s and these protests also included names such as Arthur Conan Doyle and Mark Twain which were very you know notable authors at the time oh yeah i'm i'm pretty much everybody knew who they were and pretty much eventually the Belgian government pretty much just took the ownership away from him. Yeah, him the and, government was just like, all right, listen, I, we know you're the king and all, but uh, no. <laughs> That's what they literally just did that. Yep. And pretty much, and after, you know, they took it away from him, you know, and he ended up dying a year later in the summer of 17th of 1909. But once, you know, this kind of came up, started circulating, the government had to make a very tough decision. Whether to, you know, tell the truth, the truth and kind of ruin the image of this guy who many people looked up to, to, and and pretty much have his reputation tarnished for the rest of history, or they could just decide to sweep it under the rug. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I think I guess what they did. 
and they swept it under the rug until recent times. But even there is stuff that, you know, may not fully be known, considering once the pressure really started to hit him, he ordered the records, all of his records on on the Congo Free State to be destroyed. So, yeah. But, hey, uh, even though it was uh, some time later, it came around to ruin his reputation eventually. Oh, yeah. And let's not forget something. At his estate, he had an actual human zoo, which is absolutely despicable. Oh, jeez, yeah, that is pretty despicable. And pretty much he had these Congolese stay in the exhibits, and they had to be in, in all sorts of conditions that many died from. From. From, and, and the people who visited it, they would throw peanuts and bananas at them as if they were, you know, as if they were monkeys. Yeah. Oh, you typically associate peanuts with elephants, but yeah, but bananas, oh, they're definitely monkeys. Oh, man, it is just, it's just, but even after, you know, like they stripped his, his, it stripped him of the ownership, from what I hear now, now the Congolese actually got paid wages and most of the brutality was stopped, but, but honestly, it wasn't too much of an improvement because they still treated him like absolute garbage, but. As pretty much literally every other European colony did with the power did with the colonies. Yeah, and it was absolutely just absolutely atrocious. The Congo did finally, you know, get their independence in, I think, the early, and I believe the early 70s, but unfortunately, some of the old mentality still has yet to go away. I mean, considering the fact that, that in, in terms of history, that's uh, not a very long time to be independent. Yep. So, so yeah, pretty much, pretty much he exhausted the resources, killed a bunch of people, terrorized a bunch of natives, and even breaking the own laws of, of European laws, all for the sake of profits and nothing else. Yeah, just money, money, money. Yep. So, yeah, it's estimated that he killed 10 and maybe 15 million people in this whole ordeal. But that's... Yeah, that's quite a bit. I mean, that's something that could heavily rival Hitler, but anyway... But... If... Either way, so yeah, it's definitely one of the bigger cover-ups in history, and that's why you probably have never heard of this, of this foul tyrant, so. Yeah, I mean, even in world history class, and you don't learn about him at all. Well, it kind of depends where you are. In Belgium, they definitely don't talk about anything other than the lie that he told him. basically said, oh, he did, all he did was humanitarian stuff, and there was no... Slavery, but then again, that's but then again, that's getting harder to ignore as the recent years come. Oh uh, yeah, kind of like how to this very day, Japan just Japan just brushes the events of World War Two under the rug for the most part. And that's a story about another time. Yep, yeah, most definitely. And well, that's well, everyone, that's the story and. And, our, and tune in next time for the part two of this Tyrant File series when we we cover by Pim McAfee's request as Pol Pot. And this dude was a lunatic. <laughs> oh man, man, this is this is definitely a story for sure. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. He's definitely one of, one of the more interesting guys out there, for sure. And surprisingly, I'd never even heard of him until you brought him up, so. 
Yeah, he's another one of those dictators you don't typically learn about in school. <sighs> anyway, good night, audience. Good night, everybody. Catch See you, you next time. Yep.